It is a story that begins as the Cold War ends. A story about a group of self-identified radical conservatives at the right-wing extreme of the Republican Party. A group of intellectuals and policymakers who saw the fall of the Soviet Union and communism not as an opportunity to scale back America's Cold War military machine, but as an opportunity to build up its size and scale, to use military force more aggressively and unilaterally, to construct a new, unchallenged American empire. It's this kind of ideology that has grown up in the wake of the Cold War, propounded quite openly by what we are calling neoconservatives in America, that identifies the United States as a colossus athwart the world, a new Rome, beyond good and evil. We no longer need friends. We don't need international law. Uh, like the old Roman phrase, it doesn't matter whether they love us or not so long as they fear us. after me. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly When George swear. W. Bush took office in 2000, he brought with him some of the most conservative foreign policy voices in the Republican Party. Chief among them were Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and Deputy Secretary for Defense Paul Wolfowitz, all of whom had served together previously in the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George H. W. Bush. Paul Wolfowitz, in particular, had long been recognized as the intellectual force behind a radical neoconservative fringe of the Republican Party. For years, Wolfowitz had been advancing the idea that the United States should reconsider its commitments to international treaties, international law, and multilateral organizations such as the United Nations. You know, so this is a, not just a Republican takeover. This is a very specific wing of the Republican Party. It's neoconservative, it's unilateralist, it doesn't believe in the rule of law, it doesn't believe you have to tell the public the truth. And they happen to be an extremely uh, arrogant, dangerous group of reactionary status. Uh, they're not conservatives. They have a political agenda with regards to foreign policy that they had been working on for years and years, uh, and, and writing about this, and, and, and saying this is the post-Cold War vision. This is our post-Cold War vision for American power. Ever since the Cold War ended, there were people who were fuming on the right, thinking this is the golden opportunity now that Russia's out of the way for America to take over the world. We're not doing anything about it. Those damn liberals, those soft heads, are keeping us from doing what is our godly mission. Out of power during the Clinton presidency, Wolfowitz and his colleagues affiliated themselves with a number of influential conservative think tanks. In 2000, they would craft yet another proposed national security strategy. This one published by a right-wing think tank, calling itself the Project for the New American Century. At its core, the document revived the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It called on the United States to increase the military budget by up to $100 billion, to deny other nations the use of outer space, and to adopt a more aggressive and unilateral foreign policy that would allow the United States to act offensively and preemptively in the world. The elimination of states like Iraq figured prominently in this grand vision. They were coming out against the policy of every American president, from Nixon to Clinton to even George Bush in his first year. They wanted to change that. But even these hardline conservatives knew that the Wolfowitz Doctrine was likely too radical to win the support of the foreign policy establishment, their own Republican Party, and the American people. In their defining document, written in September of 2000, a full year before 9-11, they acknowledged that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent, in their own chilling words, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. One year later, that event would arrive. 